Hi, and welcome to A Time to Thrill. This is your host, Amy Austin. Before I get into the intro for this episode, I am so excited because the first two stories in the Nicole Long Legal Thriller series have come out. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to one-click Outcry Witness or Major Crimes, stop this podcast, go buy the books, and you can come back and hear the interview. I can't wait to hear what you think about Nicole Long. This month, we're featuring author Natasha Marseguera. She is one half of a writing duo who publish a series of mysteries under the pen name Travis Myers. This is an interesting episode because it's the first time I've interviewed a co-author. I know several authors who co-write books together and it can take many forms. So in this episode, you'll have the opportunity to hear the form that this one takes. The other thing I'll say about this is that I had the opportunity to read part of um, the first book in the series, but it does... uh, let me say this should come with a trigger warning because it crossed um i have three no's in in reading and this was this was two of the three no's um the first was that there was animal mutilation which i really have no ability to stomach um and the second um is the use of the word nigger and i by non black authors so that is something those are two things um i think you should know because that was something that i struggled with and i do talk to natasha about that during this interview um it's an interesting one she (laughs) she's like me she's about the same vintage and she was born and raised in new york city during the same era i was which is not the disney era of now it's the more gritty era (laughs) from before so without further ado, author Natasha Marsegara. Hi, and welcome to A Time to Thrill with me, your host, Amy Austin. This month, I am featuring writer Natasha Marsegara, and she is the co-author of the um, Tommy Keen series. Hi, Natasha. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I do want to clarify that you are the co-author, but your your let me say the book's author is Travis Myers. Yes, my brother. Okay, so yeah, I just want to be clear. So people are looking for you to look for that. Okay. Yeah, his name always comes first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so he's trap. Okay. Well, we'll we'll get back to that. So it's nice to meet you. Yes, you too. Thank you so much. And so um, from what I understand, you just had a book come out, not just, I'm sorry, I've traveled a lot in the meantime. So in the last month or month and a half, you had a book that was released. Yes, we did. Jenny Black. And that's our third book in our series. Okay. And when was the first book? What is the title? And when was the first, when did the first book come out? The first book was Sister Margaret and we published that in 2020. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that's an interesting time to publish, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that's interesting about this is that, well, not that you co-write, because I, I know a lot of people who co-write, but you co-write with a sibling. I only know one of those. <laughs> um, and they get along like a house on fire, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, nobody gets me into the background. And I'm an only child. So for me, siblings are always an interesting idea. <laughs> yes. Um, so what is it, how did you and your brother come to co-write books? Because, well, I, okay, I'm an only child. My parents are only children. Like, I don't know. I can't ever imagine how siblings get together to do things, but a lot of them do. Well, th- for this particular endeavor, um, I'm more of the reader. My brother is dyslexic. Mm-hmm. So I'm the reader in the family. My mother was the reader. Um, I even attempted to write a couple of novels myself, nowhere to getting them published um, as of yet. But he just came up with the idea and asked me, called me up one day and said, hey, I have this idea um, to put you know these stories down. And what do you think? Do you want to co-write them with me? And I said, sure. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Um, and then we just kind of, you know, um, started, started writing it down. 
Okay, so what is your background in terms of reading and writing, I guess? Um, I've always dabbled in writing. I love, I love, I read everything I've read since I could, you know, a child. Mm -hmm. um, one of my greatest memories of my mom and I sit on, you know, separate sides of the couch and just read all day read all afternoon. So um, I wrote some, you know, articles in school. I've, you know, dabbled a little bit in short stories. Um, I did attempt to do some novel work um, so that it was just him giving me an idea. And it, they're really his stories. Okay. He is the main person in this. However, because of the dyslexia, it is, we joke because, and it's not really that much of a joke, mm -hmm. but he sends me sometimes, you know, like a 200 page sentence. Oh, wow. And that's, <laughs> he'll break it up for me sometimes. But so, you know, his stories are put together and then I get it and I will obviously break it down into readable form, you know, chapters and do all of that. And then I also am the one that will add more of the descriptions, more of, you know, when you walk into a place, he may have had, he walked in. Right. And that's it. And so I will try and attempt to, you know, add some color, some description, some idea to give you an idea of where Tommy is walking into. Okay. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and then to the editor and, you know, back and forth. And okay. So it is, it's challenging in that we live on different coasts now, too. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually get as much time as we like together. I know we work when we're together, bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, so that's really fun. Um, but for the majority of the year, we are, you know, 3,000 miles away from each other. So I'm going to gather you're in California and he's in New York then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Were you born and raised in New York? I wasn't born, but I was raised. Okay. We both raised in Yorkville. Um, that is where our books take place in it's in the um, Upper East Side mm -hmm. of Manhattan. Yeah, no, I'm born and raised in New York City. So um, yes, I'm familiar with it. Um, and so what, okay, what brought you out here? Uh, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, my parents, our, our parents, uh, my stepfather and my mother had come out to Monterey on vacation and loved it. It was sunny. It was beautiful. They came back and they said, you know what? We're going to move. And we joked and we were like, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure you are. And within about six to eight months, they, you know, stopped working. They got a van. They filled it up. They drove across country and they moved to Monterey, California. And so left us there. I was 18. So it, was, it wasn't like I was a child. <laughs> So we were, we fended on our own, Travis and I, and my other brother, Henry. And um, then it was, I used to go to the shore. So if you're from New York City, you would know the Jersey Shore. Right, yeah. I would go down and spend my summers down there working. And it was the end, it was that transition period where the summer was done and I hadn't gotten a new job in the city. And they said, come on out, see if you like it. And so I did. I moved out oh. to California. Yeah, that's the, the vacation story is actually how I kind of came out here. I mean, I, I went on vacation as a child, not child, I was 16. And I was like, wait, why don't people live out here? <laughs> and, and everybody's like, because New York City is the center of the universe. And I thought, oh, OK, but I think I'm going to go because um, it's sunny and it's delightful. I don't understand. Um, and so I'm out here and they're all still back there. Um, Are you in Northern California? I'm in Los Angeles. Right Los now. Angeles. OK, yeah. so yeah. In Central, and to be honest, it was very difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a, yeah, I'm a city girl, and I'm a New York City girl, and it was the transition, the culture shock. Wow, yeah, it was a lot. And um, I met my now husband within a hmm, about about eight nine months of being here. I was told that my parents, nope, I am not staying here. I am moving back. And they said, give it a year, you know, get, go through the seasons. Not that, not that there are any seasons, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and see, you know, see what you think, you know, after a year. And so I met my now husband and on my anniversary of making that decision, he had kidnapped me and took me to Hawaii for a long weekend. Um, as my boyfriend. And so I came back and I said, well, you know, I think I might just stick around. And 
how this hat goes. And long story short, I've been married over 25 years and we've been together 29 and I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, no, it, um, I, okay. The culture, biggest culture shock for me actually was driving. Actually, it still is driving. I have no mileage on my car. I never do because I don't like to drive that much. And I didn't realize the dailiness of driving. I don't know. That's like one of the things I just didn't understand. Um, but that's, that was to me the hardest part. Also the weather. I think the, I remember when I moved here and it was like October and I thought, wait, it's not going to get cold. <laughs> Where's my leaves? What, what is, yes, so the, I think I had the fast, I, like I missed a little bit of that fast pace. That's all I ever knew. Mm-hmm. Right? I would walk fast. I talk fast. And I remember walking one of my first weeks, I was in Carmel, California, and I, I thought I was going to have an aneurysm because everybody was so slow. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, I think the sense of humor is different. That's true. Yeah. There's no sarcasm, I don't think. <laughs> no, and I'm the, like the most sarcastic person. So that was a little challenge. And then the weather. The, it, I do miss. I miss snow. I miss watching this, you know, this change of seasons and even spring, my least favorite. But when you used to walk outside after, you know, a cold winter and all of a sudden you had that day mm-hmm. where you, it would smelled warm. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. And I, I missed that kind of change because. Yes. Yeah. So I my- travel to get that. I was just, um, I was away in spring and I was like, oh, look, the leaves are, you know, budding and all that. So I get little hits of that by traveling um, <laughs> outside of California during, especially during the change of season. It's really nice. Um, I go back to New York quite a bit. So I get my little fix. When I, I go yeah, I used to, although I haven't been since the pandemic. That's true. Um, I just realized that um, it's been, so it's been over two years, but we'll, we'll see about that. I had a lot of plans for, you know, the spring of 2020. I was going to see these plays. I was going to do all these things, see all these friends. And then that didn't happen. Yes. And the world changed. It's so, so much. So, so then what? So, if you haven't been writing for the last, let's say, 20, 25 years, um, what have you been doing instead? I do. I worked for um, hotel sales for quite a bit here in California. Uh, the industry was, um, there's not much industry here. It's a very ag in this area, mm-hmm. uh, but hotels are big, Monterey. Um, so I worked in some big hotels and I did sales for them, hotel sales. So I would sell meeting space and conferences and that type of thing. And it, it just got to the point after you have children and travel um, for work and my husband worked a lot, um, it just it was, it became too much right. for me. So I decided to just go another route mm-hmm. and I went back to school for actually healthcare billing because that's another <laughs> large <laughs> And then um, I had some health issues, so I stopped working for a little bit. And then I got a job where I work at the IBW, which is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Yeah. It's a union for electricians, and that's where my, my husband is an electrician. So he has gone through back, you know, in the 90s through the apprenticeship, and, right. you know, he's a member here. So it really became a nice fit. I knew a lot about it just through him, and I really love what I do. Funny because it's you know I'm an admin here, right. but I really just enjoy working with the members. Um, it also gives me a lot of flexibility. My bosses have been great, so I do like to travel back home since that's where my family is. My mom is there. My daughter lived there for a little bit, so um, yeah, it's that's what I do. And then I, oh, go ahead. So how do you fit? Well, okay. Reading one can fit into anything. I, I, at least in my experience, but what has it been like taking on fitting writing in, which, uh, takes, what I want to say, it takes a lot more concentrated effort and you can't read and write at the same time, which is unfortunate. So what has it been like making that transition to spending the kind of hours it takes to spend, um, pulling that kind of thing together? Sometimes to be honest, it can be difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I work full time. I have a home. I have, you know, my children are older now, so I don't have young ones anymore, but I still have a home and cook dinner. You know, the average, (laughs) you know, you clock out and you go home and you have all of this other stuff. So in the beginning, it was a challenge. I think the fact that we co-author, so there I do get breaks of time when our project might be in my brother's hand. Mm -hmm. So it's not a 
every single night. And I just dedicate my home office. I have a home office and I just said, oh, it's book time. And I just go and lock myself and, and knock out, you know, just fully focused and concentrated on that. So I don't have to do it constantly. I probably should do it a lot more in terms of marketing, <laughs> um, you know, and getting and getting the word out um, to people. We have some social media. We have a website. We do some YouTube videos, which have been fun. Um, so you get to see us and our interaction and him and listen to him. He still has the New York accent. So <laughs> I love to listen to his stuff. Um, I miss it so bad. But so I just kind of have to force myself to be like, okay, this is what I'm doing today. And I'm focusing on that. I do a lot at my, I have an hour for lunch. So sometimes I'll just, you know, shut down my work and then open my laptop and work for an hour straight. So I fit it in where the weekends and evenings and lunch hour. And is that, how does that pace work in terms of, so there's two of you, so mm-hmm. but there's deadlines. I mean, you know, we, we, as much as we would all like to work on everything forever or not, depending, um, <laughs> how does that fit or is the fit working in terms of being able to do that around other things? I think the fit works. There's definitely been times that I've been a little haggard, uh, a little under when the deadline's coming. And I just know I kind of have, I'm one of those that will let it sit in my tummy, you know, and oh my God, oh my God, it's coming. And so, you know, there are definitely times that I'm a little bit more stressed with a deadline looming over me. Um, but I think it's been working fine. Uh, it's something we love. We're really enjoying it. So we love to do it. And what, okay, so let's go back. So you're saying that your brother called you, I guess, whatever, and had proposed this idea. When was that? It was probably, we published in 2020. It was still in 2020. Okay. Um, we, we, well, actually, I, I take that back. I think it was 2019 okay. at that point. And so um, we, we, he sent me, you know, the first draft and some, some information that he had. And so I went through it and read it and we've had, it's been funny. We've, we've kind of bounced back. We've done three books now and we're on our fourth and we have some side work that we're also working on, but it was the first time I want you to read the whole thing and I'm not going to give you spoilers. And then it was well, I kind of want it piece by piece so I can work on my part while you're working on something else so we can speed up the process. So we're kind of bouncing around different um, ways for us to work. I generally like to know everything, though. Mm -hmm. I want to know what the ending is. I want to know. But the first time I did it, it was a shocker. (laughs) I was like a reader. I didn't see it coming. And it was it was pretty fun to do it that way. Um, So let me ask you, so what was the road to publication like? Very difficult, um, it, as I think for a lot of authors would be a lot of letters, a lot of, conver- you know, phone conversations, um, trying to get us out into publishing companies. We didn't, we started a little bit smaller. Um, there was one that was located in New York City, and it's kind of a funny story because my brother is a, re- is a retired New York City cop. Mm-hmm. And so to get in to this person's office, there was a little ruse (laughs) and, you know, even it it didn't work, but it was, they had a lovely conversation. Um, But yeah, it was just been, and we found this little publishing company, Bully Press, and it's been wonderful since then. So what made you choose that publisher? Because one of the things we talk about, we as authors, and actually has come up on this podcast a lot, is how you came to choose that first publisher. Um, and I don't mean first, I'm not saying you're going to leave, but a lot of people, eventually you have a string of them. It's like relationships, you know, and you look back and you've had five. Um, but how did you come to choose um, this particular small press as opposed to, well, I don't know, there's, it, it's not infinite, but there are quite a few. Right. Um, I believe, you know, it's an independent small, just like we are. Mm-hmm. Right? We're independent or we don't know a lot. We're, we're not in the business to, per se. Um, and they wanted us and we, it was a great fit. And, you know, we have a lot of ability to work with them, deadlines, how things work. Um, so it just, it, it was kind of serendipity. It just worked and we're, we're really happy. 
And so far, I'm so sorry. So this book that just came out is the third book with them then? Yes. And do you have, um, I, this is just a random question because I hadn't thought about it, but do you have a sense of like how long the series is? Because there's a lot of, uh, let's say cop series that, you know, well, they either go on a long time and there are some cops who I think have retired, come back. You know, there's a lot of things that happen um, right. when you when you conceive of something over a long period of time. Or do you have some um, series arc in mind? We do. It's for the Tommy Keen series, he is close to retirement right. and that's where we started. So there will we for he will retire. And so in that time frame, obviously, I'm not sure how many books we've talked. We have the fourth one is we are working on. I know for two more stories for sure that are happening. We've kind of kicked around the idea that when he retires, you know, do we do that kind of typical, hey, let's have him be a private investigator? Right. Um, we're not sure, but we also have ideas where we're we're working on and kind of drafting out now. We do a lot of we we do a lot at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a Tommy it's a Tommy Keen world where we have stories about you know, the precinct mm -hmm. when he was younger, but it won't necessarily be Tommy in it, but he'll have, he'll be a side character almost. And we talk about the precinct, the apartment building. Uh, we have an idea for that. There's a character that is in Jenny Black, which is our book three, that we are doing a completely side story on that character. So they will all sort of tie in because you'll have met them either in a previous Tommy Keen series book or you they're in his apartment building where he grew up in Yorkville or the precinct that he started. So we've got kind of where he may retire right. and we may, you know, le let him be for a while and then focus on this other, these other stories that we want to tell. So it sounds more like a ton of French approach and less like a Michael Connolly approach. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, so I guess for listeners, so Tana French, well, she has a lot of things going on, but the first series was the Dublin Murder Squad where the first, oh my God, four or five books, I'm going to lose this, um, focused on different detectives in the same squad. Whereas Michael Connolly with his Harry Bosch series wrote, oh my God, let's say 20 books with Harry Bosch. And then only it has later split off into um, Renee Ballard and I can't think of the guy, the Lincoln lawyer. Um, so that's, there are two ways that people, not people, there's a lot of other books in the world, but those are two distinct ways I've seen authors go about it, each having their own merit. And I actually read both faithfully. So I do like both. Yeah. So we're going to see. I think that's kind of where we'd like to see how, you know, if if the Tommy Keen world is um, as popular, you know, does Tommy Keen series need to continue? So we're not at that stage right now, but we definitely already have drafts and ideas and have started some things and written some things down of how we want to go in a different, not different, they're connected, but not so much as Tommy being the protagonist. Yeah, no. And and it may have been early to ask you the question. It's just that um, <laughs> no, so many, no, it's just so many authors I know. Like I've written um, a crime series and I'm, oh my God, I don't know how many books in I am, 12. And at some point you're like, oh, okay, I see. If I had known what I know now, I may have done the structure of the whole thing differently. Well, um, I just, yeah. your series, the Casey Court. Right. Judged. Yep. So I'm starting your series right now. Right. So it's, it's, but I started, I wrote the first book, let's say in the late nineties, you know what I'm saying? So if I had, yeah. if I knew then, I mean, you know, it's been years, um, I may have structured it differently. And also one of the things I think that, and this is, you know, talking to a lot of writers is that sometimes you don't think it's series worthy and it can be, but then mm -hmm. you didn't necessarily structure the first book for um, expansion down the road. Um, so it's just interesting different ways one can go about that. But um, I know of a couple of authors who they're like, so, or they have a, a book that's a hit and the publisher's like, this should be a series. And they're like, I not thought that far. You know, I never thought that far. Um, but it first. It, it's questions that it, it's questions that, that come. Um, so 
So can I ask you, uh, I guess I have a question about your cover design. Um, how involved were you with that? We actually, obviously we're involved. We wanted to kind of, we gave, Fred Rawls is our um, graphic designer and we love him. And we really just kind of, we knew we wanted to keep it consistent mm -hmm. throughout so that they all would be married to each other. Even if you didn't, obviously our names are on them, but you know what we wanted, that kind of old noir crime look. Um, we picked the colors and then we really just gave it to him. And obviously, you know, an outline of what it's about right. um, in them. And so he really ran with it. I, we didn't make very many changes. Okay. Um, so really, I have to give credit to Fred. Okay. And did you get, did you end up with one of those? I haven't done this in a long time. Like we used to get design worksheets. And so sometimes you'd get exactly what you asked for, which was not always good. And sometimes you'd get some wild divergence. So did you get a number of samples that you came to, or was it more tweaking uh, an original? It was really more tweaking an original. He really understood what we were looking for um, and with the different characters and, and what we wanted to represent. And he just really, um, like I said, he was fabulous. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of tweaks here and there, but we really kept with each of his first go around mm -hmm. design. Right. And then one of the things you were saying is that, so let's go back to the, that your book, your brother, excuse me, is a retired, um, is, is it NYPD officer? Or? Yep. Okay. I have two brothers and both of them are retired NYPD detectives. Okay. And what... Okay, so many people who retire want to write a book. So what was the, what do you think made him actually make the leap as opposed to talking about it? Because that's, you know, there's a lot of that. He, when he retired, he retired, actually, he was injured on the job. So he got a injury retirement, Travis did. And so after that, you know, he has his pension. And after that, he's opened quite a few He's an entrepreneur, I should say. Okay. So he has bars, he's had restaurants, you know, properties. He's had a record. He's part of a record company, Altercation mm -hmm. Records. So he has a lot of band stuff going on and merchandise with that. And, you know, it really started when we start, he thought, started thinking about it. They, when they get together, you just get them start talking and the stories are just amazing. And we've had so many times, oh, you should write that down. You should write that down. You should tell that story. And so become, you know, it starts to kind of get in your head. Oh, maybe these are fun stories. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could be something I could do. And he just has that. I think his mind is going all the time and so yeah, it was just more of that type of you're sitting in a bar and you know they're they've got everybody either laughing or you know sometimes horrified, um, and it's just one of those things that we he I want to try this you know but that's kind of his spirit he does have his he fires in all kinds of places that the iron in the fire <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I know there's a fire in here. <laughs> so he's just that type um, of person and thinks so much about that. So we really thought we we're going to we're going to try this. So you were saying that you and your mother read a lot. What kind of books did you read growing up? I started with romance. She was and I most of it came from her, she'd be like uh, handing him over to me. Right. So I typically as a, you know, I read Judy Bloom, mm -hmm. obviously child um, stories. And then I, I had a very long love affair with historical romance. Oh, and so a lot I of people do. I did not. I wonder what I was doing. I didn't, I never did. I only read contemporary. I never read, not never. I read maybe three, like one Julie Garwood and one other one. And that's about it. So what was it about historical? I'm always interested in this because I never got it. <laughs> to this day, I don't get it. In the beginning, I, I think I, I love history. Mm. So I, I've moved on from historical romances and I will read, I like to read a lot of English authors um, I like to read Philippia Gregory, for instance, does a lot of where she combines historical true fact and people, right. and then obviously, you know, makes a, a story out of it right. with filling in. So, but in the beginning, I don't, I'm, I think 
honestly, it was because she had liked them. Okay. And so she passed them on to me. And I was like, okay. It, I came to a point kind of early in, in my teens where I was thought, okay, I'm moving. I'm going to branch out. You know, this is, they almost start to become the same book. Mm-hmm. You know, and you kind of, I kind of was forgetting, I feel like I read this. I feel like I read this. And I didn't, but they kind of, you know, almost were the same to me after so, so many. So then I branched out and I found a love affair of, you know, Stephen King. Um, I let, you know, and then I also moved into thrillers. Okay. And crime books. So that's really, now I, I don't think I read much of anything except crime novels. And I love realistic compelling crime novels. I think maybe that's because we write them too. Right. Um, but I will I, I will read almost anything. So I don't write science fiction. Sorry, science fiction authors. <laughs> or, well, do you read fantasy? Because that's the other thing people either love or hate or do read or don't read. So who are your favorite crime novelists now? Um, I mean, I know my favorite. So what everybody, I've mentioned them all the time on this podcast. Nobody needs to hear those anymore. I, love, I do love Michael Connelly. Mm. I, I read Dennis Lehane mm-hmm. is one of my favorite authors and he's not as current right now. I, I went back and am reading his um, Kinsey and Gennaro series. So I'm re- I'm going through and reading that. I like John Sanford. I like, um, I'm going to forget his name. Hmm, I did. Um, Oh gosh, I literally, I'm so sorry. I just completely blank. So, but that style, I do will branch off and read Nora Roberts. I like her and I do read her as JD Robb. Okay. Sometimes for something kind of fun Mm -hmm. and short. And so do you read, um, wow, these are a lot. So, (laughs) well, no, because I, I read, I guess, differently. So do you read, um, a lot of women crime novelists? I do. I read, um, I'm going to forget her name. Oh, I should have had a list of everybody because I read constantly. I'm, I, there is, I just finished a book, um, by her and her DD. DD is her main character and I can't think of the author's name right now. I'm so sorry. Um, I read Patricia, her Scarpetta. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I read her a lot. As I mentioned, Nora Roberts, J.D. Robb, I've read, um, I have J.C., I'm I'm horrible. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Uh, I I don't keep, why can't I not keep a good read list? I'm going to be honest so that I can keep it straight. (laughs) I I bounce around a lot, so I generally don't, won't read two authors together. And sometimes I have to throw in something lighter, um, more, you know, I might get on a Stephen King you know, I'll stick Stephen King in there and then I'll just, I, I love to find new novels, which is probably why I don't remember their names, mm-hmm. but from, um, I mean, you know, my Instagram group where there's a lot of reviews and, and they, you know, have the, what's coming out new. And, and so I, that sounds great. And so I'll just go and immediately, and I'll buy it and read through it. So I remember more of the character than so much of the name. Yeah, Sorry. no. And so I'll ask you about the back to back because one of the things actually I don't do is I don't read authors back to back, but other readers do. So the readers will like, I love whomever, and I'm going to read all 50 of her books or 10 or whatever it is right now. And then they blow through it and then they move on to somebody else. And um, I've never been able to do that, but I find it interesting. So I will just, I will read authors consistently, but I don't ever read their books back to back. So I'll read, let's say Michael Conley, and then I'm going to read like 10 other things before I ever, well, he only has one book a year right now. Yeah. So well, I'm going to read a lot of other things between, you know, that and the other book. Um, but I, yeah, I vary. So sometimes I will, Oh my gosh, it will just leave me and I'll, I might do two back to back in a series. I used to read, um, again, I'm not going to remember her name. She did the, and she has um, unfortunately passed. She did the A is for B. Yeah, um, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. So sometimes I could be, they, they seem to be a little bit quicker and a shorter read. So I might have read her, two of hers back to back. Right. Um, and then I just go on to something else. I 
one of the authors, and I don't, I can't even explain how much I loved this. It was the Wallander series. Oh, uh, Kurt Wallander. You know, I was just thinking about this because I'm thinking about going to Malmo this summer. No, are you? How yes. fascinating yes. that would be. <laughs> I loved that series and I would buy chunks of them and my mother liked them and my brother got mad at me one year because he bought her it was like the second in the series Mm -hmm. and we always exchanged books we'll ship them to each other and he's like yeah I got you know mommy a Kurt Wallander I can't remember the book two's name Mm -hmm. and I was so excited and I ended up buying like Four, the next three or four and sent them to her. And he got so mad at me because he was like, yes, I, here's a series. And I was so excited. And the only reason I did it and sent them to her because she would send them back to me. Right. So I was like, <laughs> and I'd get them all back and I just would read them all the way through. And I didn't matter as, as many as I had, I was just infatuated, enamored with, and I don't really understand why. But like I can't explain. I don't know if it was his writing, the character, because he was kind of a he was kind of dark, and he had the weirdest relationship with his daughter. I don't know. Anyway, there was that I I, I could never figure out. I, I don't think I could ever figure him out. I think that's you know, and it just he I I between the writing, he was he was dark and he was sad, yes. and I, I don't know how to explain why I just was in love with this series. And I was so sad when it was over. Yeah, no, that was, it was an interesting series, but I, I was thinking about going to Malmo because I'm going to go to, I think, Copenhagen and there's a ferry that's like a 45 minute ride to Malmo. And, and somebody's like, why? I'm like, it seems like there's a lot of odd crime series set in this tiny little place. So I should go see why it is that people think, it's appropriate for crime fiction. I don't know. That's, it's just, I don't know. Um, it's odd, but it's just one of those things. Have you ever read, um, let's see, well, like Jonathan Kellerman or even his wife, Faye Kellerman, that was really popular yes. for a while. They were, I have not read them in a while. They are a lot of the, um, from the oh. Southwest. Mm-hmm. So. No, I have not either, but they live here. Um, so, I'm trying to think, but there's a lot of, so what is it that you're looking for? I ask people this a lot, a lot of the time. What is it you're looking for in a reading experience? I like to be taken away. Okay. I think, I think my reading is, especially in my world now, I'm very busy okay. I with everything going on. I like to be able to just, I read every single night, every day. So I like to just be able to be taken away where I'm just inside that book and I can see it and I I connect with what's happening. And sometimes it it could be, um, I just read The Push recently. I mean, actually, maybe not recently, about a year ago. Something I I really wasn't sure I was going to enjoy, um, but it kind of is what I wanted to stick with me too. That's a book that stuck with me. Um, some hated it. Some loved it. Um, I don't actually know where I stand, just that it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um So I like to, I like to be not necessarily transported, but I'd like to not, you know, be able to focus and, and really connect and like, I like to like the character. Ah, okay. So then yeah. in that case, are things like, um, oh my God, I'm going to forget her name. I, I can't believe this. I can see it. The one with the characters. Oh my God, not Girl on the Train. Oh my God, the other book. Jillian Flynn. Sorry. Oh yes, I like. Yes, see, I like Jillian Flynn too. And I think um, but that's interesting because everybody, not everybody. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't say that. A lot of people I know do not like her characters, not because they're unreliable, but because they're not nice. <laughs> not nice. Not nice. Does a really good job of making them not nice too and there's there's that thriller part of it and so definitely i i do enjoy her as well so i'm very eclectic i know i i'm i could like i mentioned historical right. books and you know i like things out of europe again the scandinavian has really um been jumping those crimes i have so. a lot of wonder thought about that because i so i've never been to Scandinavia, so i'm gonna go this summer but i really wonder what it is that produces so much dark crime fiction. I wonder if it's the weather. I know being dark a lot of the year. I wonder that too. I mean, I I really have a lot of, 
I have a lot of questions about it because they produce a lot of dark crime fiction and more so than we do, I think. I mean, there's like a lot of Irish crime fiction, but it's not nearly so dark. <laughs> no. And I liked, I like, I so I like a lot from, um, and again, I'm not going to remember her name. She passed away as well. And they weren't thriller crime at all. They were just stories. Maeve. Maeve Finchie. Yes. yes. I really enjoyed her stories too, because it's something, again, I could leave what I was doing and go to Ireland and, and in these little, in the restaurant or in this neighborhood and, you know, just kind of be there. I think she was really ex- excellent and ensemble work. So mm-hmm. pulling together a lot of disparate stories. The only other person I think who does that well is Philip Margolin, who writes crime, but he does the same thing where he's got like five or six characters and you're like, what do these people have to do with each other? And then you find out. Yes. Um, but I think those two authors are excellent at pulling together disparate people and then weaving a story where you're, you know, halfway through, you're like, well, these people are all kind of interesting. And then halfway through, you're like, oh, this is what they have in common. Exactly. I tried one of my first novels um, attempts at a novel was kind of based in that same realm because I was reading a lot of her and I thought, you know, growing up in New York City, I, we were raised in bars. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were always in a bar and I kind of thought well there's so many characters so many people that you meet and yet it's the one thing that's kind of connecting them all is this bar True. and so I did a main you know up in New Yorkville of course um, a bar and then the so each chapter was a different character and the connection was them meeting each other and you know when we were growing up um after work our parents would you know have a nightcap or go before dinner we may eat dinner at the bar but sometimes they would just stop and have a drink on their way home right neighborhood bar kind of thing and so we were i was always in bars my brothers were always in bars and you just meet so many people this is so interesting because this is an aspect of my childhood that I try to explain to people and they don't understand. So I actually had a friend who is European and visited the U.S. for the first time let's before the pandemic, maybe four, three or four years ago. And he had grown up similarly in Europe. And then so he brought his two daughters, I think at the time they were 18 and 20, um, with him on this trip. And he was like, but I didn't realize that you can't even take people under 21 into a bar. And I was thinking, well, in New York, you can. but um, but he was visiting, I, I want to say it was Nashville or something like that. And he was like, it was so weird to think that he couldn't, because in Europe, you can, they can, children can still go in, they can't drink, but they can go in and have food or do whatever. And he thought it was the oddest thing. And he was like, but you didn't say anything about that. And I was like, well, I wasn't thinking about Nashville. <laughs> When, you know, when we had the conversation, but I remember it as a child going, they were always dark and dusty, not dusty, but you know, the shaft of light. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember that very distinctly. People are like, but what were you doing in a bar? And I was like, I don't know. Sometimes they had a drink after work or sometimes they would order food. I'd have my father would have Manhattan clam chowder, which I cannot tolerate. But yeah. just, yeah. just the tomato. I don't understand that. But just many, <laughs> many thing, memories like that. But I think it's maybe a unique experience that you can't have other places. Yeah, I think it's very, very unique. Mm-hmm. And I remember one time my mother had asked me, I don't know why we were on this conversation, but like favorite smells and memories and, and things. And I said, honestly, one of my favorite smells mm-hmm. is a bar. It's a old, but it has, it can't be a new bar. It has to be one that had been a bar because you needed to have the, the smoke and it's not the smoke, but it's in the wall. Right. <laughs> needed to have the beer soaked in to the wooden floors it needed and i have just when i smell it every every once in a while you know i'll come across it i'll be like oh my gosh like map childhood back immediately back to my childhood um with where the pin you know the pinball machines and you know at one point we in our apartment we had moved the kitchen to a diff like we had kind of rearranged it and we ate out and across the street, we had our neighborhood bar that was a, directly across the street on 81st Street. It was called Willie's. Mm-hmm. And most of, we lived there. We lived in that bar. Um, we knew everybody. We ate probably that whole time frame. 
you know, five nights out of the week. <laughs> and, you know, to the point where when I would come home, you know, latchkey mm-hmm. kid and I come home from school, there was one time instance, because it is New York City, that I was followed. Mm-hmm. And I could tell, I knew it, I could feel it. I could, you know, hear the talk, you know. And so as in New York City, you have vestibules and I don't know if a lot of people know that. So it's a door that opens up into the vestibule before you have the locked door. And our apartment had that. And I was like, there is no way I'm street smart enough. I'm not going home. Mm -hmm. And I, I just turned right into the bar and I told them, some of the waiters went out, the bartender, you know, was like, nope, you're sitting at the bar until, you know, Travis or your, you know, Ma gets home. And it became kind of this agreement. And I sat in the bar doing my homework at the end of the bar almost every day for the rest of that year. Mm-hmm. Of course, I made it like, oh, because I liked the French fries and I get soda. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was like the fluffy French fries. They had steak fries and they were fluffy and they were delicious. And they would let me sit. I would just sit at the end of the bar and I'd eat French fries and do my homework until somebody came home. But I can imagine then the observation, the opportunity you would have to watch people because that's something. Actually, I think about this often. It's something I get less of in Los Angeles than in New York or than when I travel. Because when I travel, I'm on public transportation or I'm walking down the street or I'm in a cafe or a bar or something. And I, there's a lot more people out and about. And in Los Angeles, we're quite siloed in cars quite often. Yeah. Um, so it's a super interesting experience because you can observe, I've observed a lot of people, especially as a kid, if you're reading. And so you can disappear into the woodwork and yeah. we can sit in a corner or wherever and read and people don't people ignore children reading and yes. they're like, Oh, they're occupied and they're taking care of and they're quiet. Let's move on. But with that, then I had the opportunity to watch lots of people over my lifetime do lots of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, Good and bad and ugly and all of, it. Yeah, all of it. And I think whether I'm not saying it's a great, <laughs> a great thing, but growing up in New York city, I loved it. Um, but you do get to experience um, sometimes the ugly and and the not the nice and the bad and you know and I think part of us now you know not to move back to the books but just travel you know he has seen more than I could even ever imagine of different you know the again the good the bad and the ugly. Um, and these stories and just even us growing up, you know, Yorkville is a very small neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, even the Upper East Side, everyone's like, oh my God, the Upper East Side. Well, you know, it must be rich. And did you live in a brownstone? And, you know, those types of things. And we always laugh and we're like, well, we, you know, know because there is a portion of the Upper East Side, which is Yorkville, um, that we're on the other side of the track, so to say. (laughs) And so even our, you know, being in the Upper East Side, it was, it was very blue collar, you know, there was a lot of kids running around in the streets and, you know, in that time frame, this is 70s. So (laughs) I I remember, but we were allowed, well, I was a latchkey kid, but we were allowed, we were outside. So we were outside um, well, and I had to do a lot of homework, but other than that, we were outside and you came in when it got dark. Um, yep. and, mm-hmm. but it was, well, it was fine. I don't have a quite, I'm not as nostalgic as some people. It's not a sepia toned memory, but it was mostly, it was mostly fine. Um, and I didn't mind it. Obviously I did not have anything to compare it to, um, except that my parents, but they'd grown up in the fifties in New York city. So that's a different experience altogether. Um, yes. and when, when I, when I came around, we had just entered like the crack cocaine era and all of that. Um, so I was not there. I was older when the reforms came through and it became a much different kind of city. Um, yes. So I lived in a more gritty city <laughs> um, than it is yeah. now. I just watched a documentary on Netflix and it, it wasn't about New York City, but it was about um, a serial killer and it was in from Times Square. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, obviously was a serial killer. He killed prostitutes and um, they were, he was called the torso killer. And so I will go and, and I, I will watch crime too. I will watch everything and read everything about crime. 
And I'm fascinated with it. I'm fascinated with the good and the bad. But what was so interesting wasn't necessarily his story, which it was a decent story. It was they had so much footage of the 70s in Times Square. And that Uh, is the city, city, you know, that we grew up with and knew all the way through. That's when I learned what prostitutes were. Like, I remember because we would go, because I lived in Brooklyn and we would go to Manhattan and I would ask, I'm like, well, why are these people standing on the street or why are they not half dressed or whatever? But I was young. I was really little. And they, my parents told me there was no, there was not a lot of filtering in my family. So they told me, but that's when I learned all of those kinds of things. And I don't know if children still, well, not in New York, maybe, I don't know, have those kinds of experiences. But the, it was like everything was laid out. Like, this is what pe- this is how people live. Many, all the iterations of how people live, and they're all doing it outside. Yeah. And this is exactly how it is. So that's really interesting. Times Square is so that's different a, now. When I went, maybe- I have a funny story not to interrupt, but just you, when you brought up the prostitute, I was in a, maybe kindergarten, you know, so about a five- um, year old, and we were walking down. We and we were vi- down in the village, mm-hmm. and we were walking. And this really pretty, pretty woman was coming towards us. And she had a little fur jacket, and she had her hair done, and her makeup, and you know, little short, tiny skirt, and big heels. But I was just like, wow, she's so pretty. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like even you know, I remembered it like looking back, and I said. Oh my God, like, look, you know, I said to my father and he said, she's a prostitute. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, that's what I want to be. when (laughs) (laughs) She had a fur coat and like, it was just, you just had no, obviously that age, thank God I didn't have, you know, the understanding. It wasn't until later and they love to tell the story. Oh, so they didn't tell you what it was right then. No, no, he didn't. It was oh, still too. Oh, I remember we were walking on like 41st, 42nd, and I asked, and then wh- wherever we went, we they didn't tell me outside. We went in wherever we were going, who knows, because I was a child and nobody had told me anything. And we went inside somewhere and they explained it to me. And I was like, what, what? I was, it, was, yeah. it, 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 it took me a long time to integrate it because I didn't quite understand what, we, <laughs> the people are selling sex for money. I'm like, wait, I don't understand. Like, I just couldn't get it. Um, right. But what, so let me say this, then did, what is it that attracts, has attracted you to crime? Because a lot of, no, crime shows are popular. I always say this because I enjoy a lot of crime things. And my child is always like, does everything have to be sad and depressing and have trauma? He's like, don't you ever watch any happy things? And I was thinking probably not, but I'm not sure why that's probably what therapy is for. But what is it that attracts you to crime as opposed to, I don't know all, I don't know, frolicking through fields of daisies. <laughs> I think probably my brother's. Mm-hmm. Really, just growing up um, in the, our neighborhood, having them become, you know, New York City police officers and then detectives, hearing stories, hearing stories, you know, from a generation older, you know, in the bars from firemen and cops, and you know, having that around, um, I just believe it it triggered something, and I, I like in terms of reading about crime. Um, that there's a thriller. I'm going to try and figure out who did it, um, what happened, why. I also have a a fascination with the mind and on the bad side, right, of what what happened? Mm -hmm. What was it that made somebody switch like that? Um, You know, and I, I know the stories of you know, know, things happening when they were young and abuse. But what about the people that didn't have that, you know, childhood? Why did that happen? What switch made it? And then I also have the side of the good guys Mm -hmm. um, in my mind um, and how, what they go through and in terms of the police side of it and the sacrifice um, that they make. And so the kind of combination of all of that is something that attracts okay, me. Okay, so I have to ask you a question because um, I was thinking about, so last year, I'm going to not get this right, there was a book that Bruce Perry wrote with Oprah Winfrey called What Happened to You? And I thought it was a super interesting way of looking at people's behavior instead of asking why they did that. The question they pose is what happened to you? 
that that flips that switch but have you i have not i'm trying to think of this come across people who engage in crime without the trauma unless they're psychopaths or sociopaths which is a different whole different thing I think, yes <laughs> so I, I, no, I don't know. Um, I've not come across and I think it would do, you know, be research. I've read true crime mm-hmm. a lot too and, and kind of the back and, and typically I have found that there is some sort of mm-hmm. abuse or broken or, you know, I believe that we're all at some point pieces of our experiences right. and, you know, where you, that experience, where that leads you and how it shapes you. You know, I'm I'm fascinated with watching, you know, even in my own self, um, just what's happened and how I lived and, you know, where I lived and who I met. And I think so sometimes it's just a mind fascination as well. Um, how what an in instant, what happened that, I guess, yeah, what happened what to happened? you? What happened? Why, why did that switch turn and you become or do things that, a normal person would do. So So I guess the question, because I think about this often, um, it's not, well, I don't generally read or watch true crime, although I don't have a reason why. It's just, um, I don't know. Um, But one of the things that I was thinking, so I started um, reading, I think, I don't know if you sent me, see, I'm not going to get this right. Um, The Mm -hmm. first book in the series, because I like to give readers the first book because from having written and read a lot of romance, I know that people like the number one and they don't want to hear about anything else but the number one and they don't want to start in the middle and have to go back. Um, So to that end, I had started reading the first book in your series. And I have to ask you how can, well, I have difficulty handling um, anything graphic and okay. the book started yeah. started with my i have some hard nose in fiction and you started with one of my hard nose which was animals yeah. so yeah. how is there a reason that you did it that way because i read i will read some serial killers although i've backed away from it to be frank i don't read a lot of serial killer yeah. anymore because it's too much um what was it the choices that came into starting with such a graphic beginning well one is a true story okay Um, and, and as Travis likes to say a lot, crime, crime is ugly. It's dirty. It's harsh. Mm -hmm. It's, it is, um, graphic is graphic. And, you know, the, the story, the realistic, um, crime novels and, and Tommy's life, which is based all of our books, um, are a compilation of true stories that particular um, story happened to my other brother. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, and and I think a lot of people, you know, when they read crime and not that we want to trigger people, but that's what crime is. Mm -hmm. Crime is graphic and dirty and messy and ugly and heartbreaking. Um, And we are writing a more realistic cop story and to show, you know, the the good and the evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because we've taken different, obviously it's not, you know, cookie cutter. It wasn't exactly right. the same. Um, but that even the, the scene in the bar um, later on is a true story. Like, so parts of it, and it has been massaged and, and created into fiction. Mm-hmm. But they're all based on... Um, real people, mm-hmm. real events that have happened. And I think we wanted to stick with, and it's definitely not for everybody. I, I understand that. Um, but we we are trying to portray uh, this detective and what, in certain ways, what is police work and what do they face and, you know, what what sticks with them and what do they have to do every single day? which is why it's a job I don't think I could have. I I mean, I've done jobs adjacent to that. And those have, I could see why there's a high burnout rate because I'm like, oh, this is enough of that. Thank you very much. Um, and there's there's a piece, um, a scene really in Hayden John Marshall, which is our second, mm-hmm. that um, really just kind of, maybe sums it up in terms of, you know, the uh, detective's life. And in this particular scene, there's a young 
um, female, and she's a this amazing computer tech person. And she gets a little too close to the investigation. Mm -hmm. And so she meets up with Tommy Keen and she's crying, you know, at, at, through this. And she asks, um, how do you people do this every day? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this scene and Tommy replies and he has a tear in his eye, someone has to. And it's, you know, it may sound like a lie, um, but it's in the heart of a true, it's what a true detective's work is about. You know, every day a terrible tragedy gets dropped on somebody's desk. Right. No one else in the world outside, obviously, of the victim, the victim's family really care. Mm -hmm. But that detective must do what he can to solve as you know, this case as best he can. And as un simple and undramatic as that may sound, um, for that really kind of sums up what, you know, happens to police officers and what, like you said, uh, you know, could be a burnout. Because, you know, they're, they're putting, you know, to, you know, basically shoveling sand, right, against a tide yes. of humanity right trying to make a difference in complete strangers lives mm -hmm. and sometimes these strangers don't even like them very much you know but it's amazing to me that they they still do this and they they put themselves out there at the risk of their own lives and their relationships and you know everything else for this desire to um help somebody else. And I think, you know, yes, is it gritty and ugly and, and, and triggers, but the bottom line is this is what they have to face. This is, tr this is happens, you know, across the world every single day. So we didn't really want to sugarcoat it. It was more of a story and stories in the series to be a little bit more honest and realistic about. And so where does your publisher or you see that on the bookshelf? Cause I, on bookshelves, I'm sorry. Cause I'm thinking about there's, okay. So true crime, maybe this way does tend to be quite gritty. Um, and then mm -hmm. thrillers, they have, they run the gambit. So you have to know what you're, you have to know what you're getting into. But so would you, would you find yourself closer to the sort of true crime readership as opposed to people who are looking for, as opposed to a cozy mystery, which is not a really good example, but you know what I mean? That's like all the way on the other end. That is, yes, that is very, very, very far. I wouldn't say necessarily true crime because we, it, there is tons of fiction right. in it. Um, it's all moved around right. um, and created out of a, um, bunch of different people right. and a bunch of different stories. So, but I think in terms of the reader, I think, believe if you can read your crime and you're interested in that, you know, it could be a series for you, even though it, it does have fiction in it. Right. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the publishing company and as we looked at it as, you know, in that mystery thriller kind of it, there is still a whodunit right. to it. Um, you know, there is a crime and the investigation and, you know, what ends up happening in the end. Right. Um, so there we're kind of more, I guess, in a thriller category okay. versus the cozy. Well, no, I mean, the cozy is all the way at one end and then the other end is, yeah, I mean, there's two, I mean, it's a huge sort of, sort of window, um, but closer to the end that involves, it's a, it's a grittier end than some of yeah. the other ones, which are more, I was thinking like Elizabeth George now, who I do read a lot, who writes more about social things. I mean, there, there is a crime and horrible things happen, but she spends a lot more time leaving, talking about the social things that caused the crime to happen, like more, mm -hmm. more than what happened to you in terms of the protagonist versus what happened specifically. Yes. And I think I, I love Elizabeth George, by the way. <laughs> As well, but I think these particular the Tommy Keen series in and of itself is you know focusing on a police detective, right. really, and that's kind of where they stem from. So you know, as and I believe you know you can read each standalone. I do believe in which I do. I could look it up, you know, in terms of series. Right. He has a series, and I I may have stumbled on one, and then I always go back to the. I have. To I mean, well, order, I, are, it, it's a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. But, and as they, you know, 
the story goes on and the characters, some come, you know, some are in all, some come and go and, and you'll see them again. But as you go through them and read them, it does become not necessarily the the crime and the grittiness. We do show it at, or write it right. um, so that, you know, there's an understanding of what they have to do. The same thing in, in Hey John Marshall, there's some parts that are, um, heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for Jenny Black, for instance, is a lot longer of a book and it's a little bit more, yes, it's still a mystery. It's an, it's a investigation. It's a thriller. You don't know what happened, but in this particular book in all three of them and moving forward, you start to learn about him as a person and his family life and his mom and his relationships with the different detectives and talking about, you know, police work and being a cop. And so there are going to be parts that soften Mm -hmm. um, a little bit. So it's not just horrific all the way through. Um, And so you kind of get to learn, but it's, it's learning about not only a crime and how to investigate it, but the kind of the people that do it. Right. As well. Okay. No, it makes sense. So with that, I'm going to um, let you go. But thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk about books and your books. It was so fun. Yes. um, Today. And I thank you so much for sharing all of that with our listeners. Of course. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate your time. This has been a time to thrill with your host, Amy Austin. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll share, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It will help others to find and enjoy my conversations with brilliant creators. Also, please hit the subscribe or follow button on your podcast app. In addition to hosting this podcast, I am also the author of the Nicole Long series of legal thrillers. The first two books in the Nicole Long series are now live. You can download Outcry Witness and Major Crimes to your e-reader right now. I'm also the author of the Casey Court series of legal thrillers. These titles are available where other books are sold, your local library, and also an audiobook. You can also follow me on Instagram at ThrillerPod. You can find me on Facebook at Legal Thriller Author or A Time to Thrill. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back soon with more great conversations.